When congressional members, Gerald, have asked the Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke to quote from the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, which is being trashed right now, right? But to quote from there, what gives the Fed the powers, quoting the Constitution, to engage in and do what it is that they are actively doing? It seems to me the response is, well, Congress has empowered us to do what we're engaging in or to do what it is that we're doing. Something seems wrong with that. And what about the Federal Reserve and the fact that when you look at the Constitution, there doesn't seem to be much allowance for the existence of this non-governmental body that's privately owned and probably has European tentacles? Well, it's very clear in the Constitution. It's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. Congress has the sole authority to print and regulate the supply of money. And from what I was taught in school, the Constitution had to be amended. And the Federal Reserve Act was pushed through, as I'm sure your listeners well know, on uh, Christmas Eve in 1913, when, you know, it was horse and buggy days. No one was in Washington. So I always asked the same question over and over. This is illegal, according to the Constitution. Why isn't it being prosecuted as such? Who is this group of people? Who anointed them? And as everyone knows, again, that listens to your show, the educated ones that are familiar with the history, this was a major issue of this country since its inception, about foreign bankers hijacking the nation. And they have. Wall Street's hijacked Washington. I mean, who's our Treasury Secretary? Oh, the former, former president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank? What, am I an imbecile? Who, who was the guy before him that was the Treasury Secretary? Henry Paulson, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs? What, am I stupid? I mean, come on. Oh, there's a firewall. Yeah, there's a firewall. There's a firewall, there's Santa Claus, and there's a tooth fairy. I mean, how could people believe this cheap trick? And they're robbing the nation. And here's my greatest fear, Eric. They become so emboldened to steal as much as they want, and they're failing. It's going to fail because you can't print phantom money out of thin air backed by nothing. The whole system's going to collapse. What we fear is that after they do that, and considering the track record of the banksters and the gangsters, they're going to take the nation to war. And they may either do it under a false flag pretense. Remember the main, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and ties to al-Qaeda, the Gulf of Tonkin. Or it may be real. But they're going to do something, and that's what we fear the most, is that the criminals, because money junkies don't care, you know, the addicts, an addict will do anything. They have no bonds, no bounds, no family loyalties or loyalties to friends. They'll do anything they want to do to get their money fixed. So we're concerned that the next fix is to fix it permanently and take this country to war to satisfy their greed and need. I'm sticking on this point for just a minute, Gerald. We've had a Federal Reserve before in the United States, as you know, called the U.S. Bank. And people had to revolt and violence and led by President Andrew Jackson had to remove the U.S. Bank from existence and give power back to the Treasury, as you said. Are we looking at a situation where you see in the future the citizens wanting to eliminate the Federal Reserve? Not only eliminate the Federal Reserve, but eliminate the federal government. We can see these secessionist movements gaining more and more strength. We can see the United States becoming like the former Soviet Union. And it was, now it's the USSA, you know, United States of, uh, of Soviet America, and it could be break up just like the USSR did. We see that happening. How could any thinking adult, how could anybody that has any dignity or respect for themselves look up to people like Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, Bonner, Bond, McConnell, Shelby, Larry Moore, Curley, and think that these people are smarter than they are, and they know what's best for you. So thinking adults, the 15% we believe, are going to be very vocal and responsible for changing the complexion of this country in 20 years we forecast it will look radically different than it does today. Let's move on to the economy, Gerald, because virtually all economists, well over 90 percent, are saying the U.S. is out of this recession here in the third quarter, and others in government are saying we are in recovery. What is really happening here with the economy, Gerald? Well, again, 90 percent, I'd say about 98 percent of them were wrong in calling the recession. And you could go over the facts and the data, name the names, and they didn't call it. 
And by the way, we were just going over some back trends journals, Eric. In 2004, we wrote that in 2007, America would enter, quote, the Great Recession, which they're calling it now. So the ones that didn't see it happen are now saying what's going to happen next. The stimulus programs are working. They're stimulating the economy, just like any drug on the market stimulates a false feeling of getting rid of the symptoms, but not attacking the cause. And stimulus is being dumped on the world marketplace worldwide. And so it's taking its course. It's papering over the cracks. Again, this is no recovery. It's a cover-up. They've covered up the great collapse of 09 that happened in March of 2009 when the stock market sunk to, what, about 6,600. It collapsed. It's over. The only thing they're doing is they're propping it up with pillars of paper money, and it's going to run out. What's going to happen when the stimulus money runs out? What do you do for Act 2? What about this chasm, Gerald, between rich and poor in the United States, which is the largest of any industrialized nation? How does that play into the second American revolution you describe? Well, it plays into it very big in the sense that we're looking at, as we're talking about a revolution, we're also talking about a renaissance. And let me explain why. A renaissance is a rebirth, a rediscovery. In, in Italy, during the height of the Renaissance, they would say, Ale Romana e Alla Antica, in the manner of the Romans and the ancients, to describe the quality of their work. So when was America at its greatest? Well, the facts don't lie. This isn't hyperbole. When we didn't put our faith in Wall Street, but we had all our money and all our business on Main Street. When we didn't have Walmarts, we had mom and pops. We weren't slaves to factory farms or captive. We had family farms. And that's the model that worked the best. And for us to regain our strength, that's what we have to go back to. Because, as you mentioned, the gulf between the rich and the poor is now the widest of any of the industrialized nations. When you go back to Main Street, mom and pop and family farm, we were, Eric, the most egalitarian nation on earth and the envy of the world. And that's the model we believe that we need to put back into place and that that's going to be part of the Renaissance. 